Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to this morning's study. And um, we're going to get right back into where we were yesterday um, and a little bit of discussion. And of course, we're going to continue trying to draw a line of uh, these verses 23 and 24. But before we get there, we have to kind of finish off 22. But let's begin with a word of prayer. Uh, dear Father in heaven, we are so thankful for the time that we have this morning to open your word together. And we invite your spirit's presence into our hearts and into this study. We know, Lord, that um, we can see things a certain way. And sometimes um, we need to be open to your spirit's leading to be corrected and, and to be guided. And so we just ask that as we continue to look at these things, that we can uh, receive uh, the light that you want us to have, and that it can strengthen our conviction and faith and trust in you, and that it can be seen in our lives, in those that we have contact with. We ask for your angels' care and protection for each person, and that those who are watching these videos um, will be able to um, to see things clearly, and that your Holy Spirit can help them in their the day-to-day -day struggles as we seek to perfect a Christian character. Be with us now, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so um, I just bring this 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 chart up because uh, I was looking at it. Uh, we're going to come back to this, um, but before we do that, here's what we actually I wanted to bring up was this one. So, um, and, and we were looking yesterday at, uh, and had quite a bit of discussion regarding it. I didn't get a lot of commitment from people, but it was this verse 22. And with the arms of a flood shall they be overflown uh, from before him and shall be broken, yea, also the prince of the covenant. So, there are two different uh, common interpretations of this within Adventists. We have um, Uriah Smith's interpretation, which really is just, um, uh, what's the guy's name again? Uh, Bishop Newton, right? So Thomas Newton. Um, and his interpretation is based upon actually a mistranslation of the Hebrew. He says, um, the arms of the over, overflower shall be overflown from before him and shall be broken. Um, so there's a number of problems there. So it's actually the arms of a flood, um, not an overflower. And uh, he's leaving out the fact that um, this also, this word has attached to it, that is the overflow is they shall be overflown. That is, the Hebrew word is clearly they shall be overflown. Overflow. That is, it's a masculine plural, right? It, it's not referring to an individual. It's referring to a group of people. So they shall be overflown. So, but that's the, that's the view that um, Uriah Smith uses. He just uses Thomas Newton's interpretation. Now, the thing is, they say this signifies revolution and violence. And in fulfillment, we should look for the arms of Tiberius, the overflower, to be overflown, or in other words, for him to suffer a violent death. Now, that doesn't really make sense, you know, based on the Hebrew, for one, but also every time we look at the flood, and that's what we're going to do here right now, is we're going to look at this word, uh, flood. Now, um, so when we look at the Treasury of Scripture knowledge, um, they're going to use uh, Daniel 11, verse 10. So let's just go there first. And I need to change over to here so you can see this. But his son shall be stirred up and shall assemble a multitude of great forces. And shall certainly come and overflow and pass through. Then shall he return and be stirred up even to his fortress. 
Now, how did we apply this? So this is the king of the south shall come into his kingdom, shall return into his own land, but his son shall be stirred up. And so we have this overflowing and passing through. How did we interpret this? The overflowing and passing through. I know we're jumping back. But if we remember, this was dealing with, of course, Greece and the, the battles between the king of the north and the king of the south. So when they overflow it and pass through, they're going to assemble a multitude of great forces. They're going to have a large army. So one thing we can say about this is that when you have an overflowing and a passing through, that it's a military act. Can we agree with that? That, based seems, on this? that seems to be the connotations to it. Yeah. And and one of the places we, we first looked at this, that we talk about it, it is in Isaiah chapter 8, right? So in Isaiah chapter 8, um, starting at verse 7, Now therefore, behold, the Lord bringeth up upon them the waters of the river, strong and many, even the king of Assyria and all his glory. And he shall come up over all its all his channels and go over all his banks. And he shall pass through Judah and shall overflow and go over and shall reach even to the neck. And the stretching out of his wings shall fill the breath, breath of thy land, O Emmanuel. So you can see here, this is Assyria coming against um, um, Judah right now. Of course, it's also going to come against northern Israel, but it's going to overflow and come up to Judah, even to the neck. So, so this um, this overflowing uh, shows up in lots of different places. I'm just seeing here what they are giving um, as references. Right, Isaiah 30 verse 28. His breath has an overflowing stream. They have overflowing there, and and here you can see the word overflow is shataf. That that same word seven eight five seven. That is. Uh, when it says um, overflown, right? So this is the verb, right? And here in this case, it's just the masculine singular. He shall overflow. And and it's a different form. This is the call form instead of the nifal form. So the other one is um, a different form, a verbal form. So that's why this he shall overflow instead of he shall be overflown. Right. The other one says that he will be overflown. This one is the act of he shall overflow. But anyway, that's just a technical thing in the Hebrew form of the word. Okay. So, um, and, and you can see here, it, it says the call form to overflow, to flow, to run. Uh, the nafal form to be swept away. That is to be overflown. And so in this verse, uh, Isaiah 8 verse 8, it's in the call form. And in Daniel 11, verse 24, 22, it's in the nafal form. So that means to be overflown, not to to overflow, right? Okay. Does that make sense to people? So something can, you can be doing something or something can be done to you, right? So the nafal form means it's done to whoever. The call form means the the person there is doing it. Right. Okay. So these are things that, uh, you know, it, it's hard to tell with like Strong's. You can't really tell what the form is. You have to know. Uh, that's why Scholar's Gateway is good because it gives you the form of the word. Uh, but it's pretty, it's, it, Hebrew grammar is actually really simple. It's easy to learn these different forms. Sometimes you can be fooled because, you know, just there's sometimes irregular forms. But, but in this case, this is pretty straightforward. Okay. And then, um, so other places, so this is, um, this word, um, to overflow, it's used 31 times, right? So, um, we see there Isaiah 8, 8, Isaiah 10, 22. So it's used in, in lots of different ways, but when we, this overflow and pass over, the, what, the other place that we are uh, familiar with is as Isaiah 28, right? So this is that where we deal with line upon line, right? Precept upon precept, 
your little, their little. Right. Um, so in verse 14, it says, um, wherefore, hear the word of the Lord, ye scornful men that rule this people, which is in Jerusalem, because ye have said we have made a covenant with death and with hell. We are at agreement when the overflowing scourge shall pass through. It shall not come unto us, for we have made lies our refuge and under falsehood have hid ourselves. So what's the overflowing scourge? What, what do we understand that to be? A scourge is like a, a lash or a whip. How have we always interpreted this verse? Like a type of correction, a discipline. Well, we've taken this as the Sunday law, right? Okay. This overflowing scourge. This movement has always understood this to be referring to the Sunday law. And, and you can see the group that is experiencing this is uh, the leadership of God's people and God's people who follow that leadership. Right. If we read the whole context of this chapter and then and then we have it as a contrast. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, behold, I lay in Zion a foundation stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. He that believeth shall not make haste. Judgment will I also lay to the line and righteousness to the plummet and hail shall sweep away the refuge of lies and the water shall overflow the hiding place. So now here again, you have that same word, shataf, in the call form. And your covenant with death shall be disannulled, and your agreement with the grave shall not stand. When the overflowing scourge shall pass through, then shall ye be trodden down by it. So again, we can see that this is the judgment against God's people that happens at the end of the world in the Sunday law. Do we agree with that? Can you state that a different way? This is referring to the Sunday law. This is God's people, God's church. They're going to be swept away by the Sunday law. And then okay. there are those that are established upon the foundation of Christ, the foundation of the message, that um, shall not make haste. That is, uh, they shall not be taken by this flood, this overflowing scourge. Right. So you have those that are, that are trusting in Christ, this precious cornerstone, the sure foundation, the tried stone. Right. And then those that have a covenant with death. There's two classes. And and the judgment also will I lay to the line. That word, that line is the same line that's talked about precept upon precept, line upon line. And it's a line of righteousness. And the plummet, those are the way marks on a line. Those are, so righteous judgment will I lay to the line and righteousness to the plummet. So the line is a line of judgment and the way marks are way marks of righteousness. That, that Hebrew word um, that we get uh, Jehoshaphat from, or, or pardon me, no, Tzedak. Yeah, so that's, I'm um, trying to think of the name that comes from that. Um, anyway, Tzedak. Right. Righteousness. Six, 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 six is the Hebrew number for righteousness. OK, so so we have that symbol in our lines as well. Um, and so so we have this judgment. That's the word uh, mish, mishpat. Right. And then we have righteousness. Sidak. And we have this plummet and the line. So we have the plumb bob, right? This weight or plummet that's, that's vertical. And then the line is horizontal. <clears throat> okay. So to me, this is, is the primary place where we really understand what this overflowing scourge is, this overflowing. So when we get to Daniel chapter 11, and there's a few other verses we could look at, but they're just going to tell us the same thing. So when we get to Daniel chapter 11, and it's going to talk about this overflowing in verse 10, overflowing and pass through, um, verse 22, and the arms of the flood shall they be overflown from before him. And then we also have, um, and this is, 
in verse 40, uh, Daniel 11, verse 40. And at the time of the end, shall the king of the south push at him, and the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind with chariots, with horsemen, and with many ships. And he shall enter into the countries and shall overflow and pass over. So we understand that to be the Sunday law, right? It That is, we are now in the time of the Sunday law. Now, of course, there's going to be more involved. He shall enter also into the glorious land. So we can say the first one is 1989. And then he enters into the glorious land. And many, many shall be overthrown. But these shall escape out of his hand, even Edom, Moab, and the chief of the children of Ammon. And he shall stretch forth his hand also upon the countries. And the land of Egypt shall not escape. So that's the UN, the dragon power. He shall have power over the treasures of gold and of silver and over all the precious things of Egypt. And the Libyans and the Ethiopians shall be at his steps. But tidings out of the east and out of the north shall trouble him. Therefore, he shall go forth with great fury to destroy and utterly make away many. And he shall plant his tabernacles of his palace between the seas of the glorious holy mountains. Or between the seas and the glorious holy mountain. Yet he shall come to his end and none shall help him, right? So that's going to be the final end. And then it's going to, in verse one, at the time of the end, shall Michael stand up. So this is the close of probation. So this is how we understand Daniel chapter 11, verse 40 to 41. So if we look at verse 22, we have to, we have to recognize that whatever's happening here, it's, it's a type of the Sunday law and to say that this is Tiberius, um, so we have swearing David who says it's Tiberius, uh, that the ones that are going to be overflown are the alleged seditionists, uh, the ones that uh, Tiberius is paranoid about uh, causing sedition, um, which makes no sense. And then we have uh, the interpretation of Thomas Newton, um, which says that this is re- referring to um, uh, basically, it's it's in the time of Tiberius as well, um, but he's going to be overflown. So, which doesn't make sense based on the Hebrew. So it's talking about his demise. But in the context here, what we have suggested is that it's talking about Tiberius in verse twenty-one, but it's not talking about about Tiberius in verse 22. It's talking about God's people being a persecuted, which is going to be later. Right? So it's going to talk about what's going to happen, the persecution that's going to happen. And it will happen just as it happened to Christ. So first, Christ is the first one. He's going to be crucified. And so are God's people going to be persecuted but not in the time of Tiberius it's not talking about the time of Tiberius so this would be uh, I mean we could we could apply it to a uh, Titus right so if we take it, the arms of the flood shall be overflown from before him we could say that this is the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD right so more more specifically but that is the result of the crucifixion of Christ so, so we would say specifically it's 70 AD, but it's not, it's not Tiberius, it's Titus. And then it's going to go back, verse 23 and 24, and, um, it's going to expand upon that, right? So it's going to expand upon why the city of Jerusalem is destroyed. It has to do with this leak, right? Which, which we say is, uh, is this, Zoom into. That's the line we're drawing. Okay. Now, when we make an application to our time, then we know that we have um, Obama, uh, Trump. Um, who else did we have? Oh, yeah. So, um, yeah. So we had uh, Bush the second, Obama, and then Trump. That's Tiberius. But then it's going to talk about the destruction of Jerusalem and and what we have to understand what we have to try to figure out exactly is how we make an application 
of verse 22 to our time. That is, here in this section, we don't have Biden being mentioned. Right? So it's not going to go through, um, it's not going to get to Biden, right? As, as a person, he's not going to be represented. So the vile person is going to be Trump. And then it's going to talk about the crucifixion of Christ. We have, to, we have a way in which we understand this. And the arms of the flood shall be overflown, which is the Sunday law itself. So that's something future. But, uh, the prince of the covenant being broken, that's something that has already happened in our history. And then it's going to go back to this league. And so what I'm suggesting in this league and what happens there is, uh, typifying what has happened within the movement itself. And, and we've already seen that because when we've made this application, even for a time, uh, we made an application of it historically when it comes to Rome, and we also made an application within our lives, lines itself. So the 6256, we have these spans. It gives us this period um, connected to uh, November 9th, 1989, to uh, November 9th. 2019, and it gives us the center date of that. Um, and then, um, so, so anyway, we're going to look at that again. So just, but, but that's the general idea. So, so we've had a day to think about it. Does it make sense to interpret Daniel 11 verse 22 the way that I've interpreted it? That the arms of the flood are, are going to refer to uh, the destruction of Jerusalem, which is a type of of the destruction at the end of the world. So if we go back to that document, so we say he shall be overflown. That's going to be the destruction of Jerusalem. We equate that to the Sunday law from before him, God's face and shall be broken. This is persecution that happens after the Sunday law. Yea, also the prince of the covenant which is just referring back to the crucifixion of Christ. And we put that as July 18, 2020 in the 777 structure. So we're, we're taking July 18, 2020 as a symbol of the cross in this uh, application to our present truth history. And then it's going to go back in, in verse 23 and 24. We haven't gone through it in detail in our application. But it's just going to go back through that whole history of the Jewish League to the destruction of Jerusalem, and then uh, what happens with uh, the um, Edict of Milan, and then Rome moving its capital from Rome to Constantinople. So, verse 22. Can we have some more discussion regarding that? People have had a, a day to think about it because it was yesterday we introduced this interpretation of it. And I, and before the study started, I never thought about it really at all. So the interpretation came during the study. I mean, I did think about the other interpretations, but I never thought about that interpretation. So that was completely new to me as well. So you and I were seeing that interpretation for the first time in real time right, together. So this, so this interpretation kind of came on the fly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. After thinking about things, often what happens in the study is I think about things and, and that never came into my mind once until the study started. Right. So that, that's really common. I'll think about things, but the answer, the insight doesn't come until the beginning of the study. So when we're, when we're dealing with this on 1122. Yeah. We're dealing with the verse that reads and with the arms of a flood, Shall they be overflown from before him and shall yeah. be broken? Yea, also the prince of the covenant. Mm -hmm. Now, in this, I think that, that we're all in agreement that the only prince of the covenant we could be referring to here would be Christ. Right. This is Christ, and that's the, the most common interpretation. Okay. So what's an uncommon interpretation? Uh, actually, well, when you start putting a Tychus Epiphanes in here and you put this as uh, the the priest at the time, uh, I can't remember his name, at the time of the Tychus Epiphanes. 
Well, okay. but that would be, that would be within Adventism. That would definitely be a minority position, but that would actually be the most common interpretation. Um, but within Adventism, this being Christ would be the most common. But other people don't see this as Christ. Other churches generally, we do. In in a situation like this, though, how could Antiochus Epiphanes be the prince of the covenant? No, no, he's, it's the priest at the time who is the prince of the covenant. Whatever the priest's name is, I can't remember the priest, the high priest. At the time when Antiochus Epiphanes comes, that's who they say the prince of the covenant is, the high priest. Okay. Which we don't take that interpretation. So just forget about that. That's, that's a completely false interpretation. This is referring to Christ. Okay. Well, while we agree that this is a false interpretation, we're mm-hmm. going to have to be able to show why this is false, right? Yeah. Well, we've done that already all the way through here. That is a, a tie kiss epiphanies. Like the way that that uh, the preterists interpret this. That is, they believe the book of Daniel was written in the second century. So that means because you can't predict the future, the Bible never predicts the future, ever. Okay. Okay, um, so in, in this situation, what you're saying and, and what we're looking to present here for, for everybody's understanding mm-hmm. is Antiochus Epiphanes in about 171 BC, had deposed the high priest, which was Jason. Yeah, that's the guy's name, Jason. And replaced him with Melanius mm-hmm. or Men- Menalis. However, you say the guy's name. It- okay, who had offered Antiochus a large bribe to secure the office. Right. So, <clears throat> in no manner <clears throat> is Antiochus righteously doing anything because for this flood to come against God's people, a unrighteous thing is coming against the righteous people. Would could would and could we agree with that? Well what we would say is that when you have a flood, it symbolizes a judgment against God's people. Some of those people are going to be have uh, an agreement with death, or made a covenant with death, and some of those will be founded upon a foundation. The ones who have the covenant with death, they shall be swept away, right? The ones that right. founded upon the rock, Christ Jesus, they will be saved, right? So, so the flood is always this judgment of God, and it's a, it's 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 used in a military language. The flood, the idea of a flood is a military assault, right? That, that's, it's an army of people coming overflowing. Well, and over. What I see so, is... So it's symbols. Okay, yeah, Ron? What I see is an overflowing. The way it's been used throughout Scripture has always been in terms of water. Uh, you can That water is... Um, as we can tell there, it's a scourge. So it's a it's a um, uh, a chastisement or a um, correction, if you would. Or as I think it was Dwight that said that. So yes, um, mm-hmm. the it seems as so that they can be used in the manner that you're speaking of. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it's meant to be a, a correction, but there's always going to be two classes. Right. And, and we see in, in Isaiah 28, it's it's well, going to lay this on a line. Right. So that line is a reform. Right. So we have to be able to lay this on a reform line in order for it to to place it correctly. Brother Theodore. Yeah. Um, I, I don't want, I don't know how to phrase this or how to say this. But yesterday you put on WhatsApp that we cannot know the future, right? Yeah, we can't know the future. Well, then why are we studying this? Okay. We can't predict the future. That is, we can't predict. That's different. That's different from knowing it. You can know the future, but you can't 
predict it. Right. Yeah. Well, that's what I put as I said, you can't predict the future. No, you can't. You can't. No, you didn't. You said we can, we cannot know the future. Okay, let that's me what see you what... put on WhatsApp. Um... And I bring it up because I, I can, we could not know. Okay. So predict, but I'm, I'm writing it in the context of what this guy is saying. Right. 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 Well, um, he's, he's, pre, he's I'm, putting, I'm just he's having problems point. with it because, because if the Bible, if Daniel told the king what was going to happen to his kingdom and the kingdom before, after it, yeah, is what, that not what, knowing, is that not knowing what the yes, future you're, is? you're correct. You're correct. You're correct. Yeah. I'm not agreeing with you. Yeah, you're correct. But in the context there, I'm just saying, He's giving specific dates. Oh, right? okay. Well, right. I just wanted to clear it up. I just, I just, it, it bothered me, and I just wanted to clear it up. Yeah, you did say uh, we yeah, no, cannot no. know the future. Is that what you? Right. Said? That's what you yeah. wrote. Because he's writing that he has these specific dates. I could have used the word uh, "we cannot predict specific dates." That in would the that would been better if you used "but not predict" because. Yeah. God has given us in his word. Yeah, the, I know. But I mean, to, obviously I believe that we can, we can, we can know, we can know that events are coming. We just can't know when. Okay. Right. I'm sorry. I had to bring it up, but it was bothering. Okay. okay. But yeah, but yeah, so we can't, we can't predict exactly when things are going to occur. And, and in that sense, we can't know the future. Right. We can know it's coming down the pipe. We just can't. We don't really see it until after it's passed. Right. That, and that's what I'm trying to say there. Because remember, he's giving specific dates. Uh, Heliomar, whoever he is. Right. So he's saying that we can know specific dates. And, and he's using he always uses the most bizarre uh, ways of trying to predict things. Like they don't make any sense at all. When he first started uh, sharing stuff on on WhatsApp, I actually thought he was mocking us. Um, and this was quite a while ago, a few years ago, because he would not only use these bizarre ways, but he would have mathematical errors in what he was doing. That is, the thing, numbers didn't even add up. Um, and I would always ask him about it and and, and try to correct him, and he would never be corrected. He would always insist that the math was correct, even though I could show him that it wasn't. Um, so he's continued doing this, and he's he's taking uh, the symbol. I, I don't know if he watches. He must watch our videos or something, and we mentioned March 7th, so then he's going to uh, mention all this stuff, and he's going to uh, take these numbers, mix them up. There's no There's no... There's no structure to anything that he's doing. And, and then he's going to arrive with this 622,440 days that he's going to count. And so, uh, so he says May 25th, 2025, the year of the Sunday law in the spread. Um, right. So, so I say, I do not think you make sense. You start with a false premise and ignore everything that God has been showing. And he says, I'm not getting a little off subject though. Right. So so then he starts talking about, you know, we can know things. God can reveal things to us. Um, you know, surely the Lord will do nothing but he reveal this his secret, secret unto his servants, the prophets. And that's true. And then I just write, we cannot know the future. Right. That is in the detail in which he's trying to describe it. Right. So obviously, you know, Daniel, Daniel is writing these prophecies about the future. When are these prophecies understood? After the events or before after, the events? After the event. They know they're coming up, but it's not until after the event passes that, that they are able to see it. Right. And, and that's the point that, that I think we always have to take into account. When we're looking at what's coming in the future, we know that God has predicted it. Right? But it's after the events come to pass. Jesus says... I've told you things before they come to pass that when they come to pass you may believe that i am he right he doesn't tell us things before they come to pass 
so that we can predict exactly when things are going to occur. Right. This was my problem. I'm saying. Yeah. So when we had time setting coming into the movement, I was extremely careful in how I looked at it. Right. So my view was Ellen White's counsel against time setting is solid. I wrote a paper on it at the time. Right. So, you know, when, as soon as Tess had her date, um, and I confirmed it with the 391 and a half days, I wrote a paper. And in that paper, I, I have this whole introduction where I clearly show that we cannot predict any of these dates that Ellen White is talking about. The Sunday law, the close of probation, uh, the outpouring of the latter rain, or any promise of special significance. That Ellen White's counsel against time setting stood, and that the only way that we could have time in this movement was in a typical fashion. That is, we were stuck in this time within this movement because we are repeating Millerite history. And Parminder is the one who injected the movement with time back in 2012 when he made a prediction about a Sunday law in 2014. That's originally rejected by Jeff as fanaticism. But then Parminder sneaks back into the movement and then later says that, well, you know, I was actually right. You know, I was right about... Um, the, the 151 uh, shekels and, you know, 126 shekels and, and 1888 and so forth. Now, now Jeff tried to say, well, Parminder was right, but he was also wrong. Right. Cause Jeff said, well, there is no Sunday law in 2014. And, and there was this big controversy going on between Tess and, and Jeff that kind of went under the radar for some people, you know, half right, half wrong thing. Um, so Tess was putting that upon Jeff, that Jeff was half right and half wrong. And Jeff was saying that, you know, Parminder had been half right and half wrong. Um, and, and what I would say is that simply that the movement at the time didn't understand its disappointment. We were in a period of darkness, right? And that darkness then was dealing with time and these predictions. And, and the movement had all kinds of opportunities to be corrected, but it would not be corrected until after July 18, 2020. And even then, most of the people in the movement were like the Millerites after October 22, 1844. They just want to keep predicting things. So that's the initial thing that the Millerites did. They kept setting dates. They didn't just all uh, abandon time setting, right? Right on October 22nd, 1844. They figured we had the wrong date. So you're going to have people setting dates. But eventually... What are they going to do with time setting? What is, what is the Millerite movement going to do as the larger majority of it who stays in the Millerite movement? What are they going to do? Are they going to abandon time setting? No. Yes, they do. Okay. They abandon time setting. The vast majority of Millerites abandon time setting. You only have a few groups, um, that still continue time setting that, that the age to come people, which, you know, is Barber. He comes out of the Millerite movement sort of, you know, late, but, you know, he's going to set what it is 1776 or 1876 or something like that. Um, and then Christ doesn't come then. And then he says that Christ came invisibly. A follower of his is Charles Taze Russell. Charles Taze Russell then sets another date, 1914. When Jesus doesn't come back then. He says that Christ came invisibly. Um, Right. I've run into another Jehovah's Witness who now says that Christ came invisibly in 1992. And he is Christ. This guy named Charles Smith. That's not his real name. I can't remember his real name. But, um, you know, so there are people who have continued time set. And so Adventists don't continue time setting. Right. Now, there is a group that does for a little while. Um, uh, you know, Joseph Bates is part of that group. So, um but anyway, the point that we have here, I guess that we're, we're trying to discuss as far as time, we know that everything that's been happening in our movement, all of these dates that we're placing here are not meant to predict some event. We have a date coming up, you know, we have April 10th, the first day of the first month. Well, that's a symbolic date. 
it, its symbol because it attaches to another symbolic date and, and to other parts of dates in our line with these symbolic numbers that we get from um, the Hebrew, uh, you know, numbers in Strong's Concordance, right? So, so that can tell us that we are on the right track, that how we're understanding these verses and the applications that we're making to our movement in the present truth application are correct. But they're not meant to predict, you know, that something's going to happen on April 10th. Yeah, you know, we're going to have the lunar or solar eclipse on April 8th, you know, three days before or two days before, depends how you count. Uh, and, and so we, we have these things happening, you know, in connection with, with dates, but they're not meant to predict some event or any promise of special significance or anything like that. All they are is a witness that God has been leading this movement in what we have done in making a prediction on July 18, 2020, because we're repeating Millerite history. And this helps us to understand an application of Daniel 11 to our time so that we can discern clearly that uh, we are on the right track, that, that what we are doing, and it brings a power and a conviction to us. Okay, so... So it's good you brought that up because we could have that discussion again. Okay, so well, I don't um, want you to. I don't want you to think I'm I'm against you or anything. I just it just it bugged me about it. <laughs> I never thought that. <laughs> okay, uh, the league agreement or covenant in Isaiah eight verse nine to twelve. Um, so if you go to Isaiah chapter eight, um. It's going to talk about this, associate yourselves, O ye people, and ye shall be broken in pieces. And give ear, all ye of far countries, gird yourselves, and ye shall be broken in pieces. Gird yourselves, and ye shall be broken in pieces. So we can see some repetition there. Take counsel together, and it shall come to naught. Speak the word, and it shall not stand, for, the, for God is with us. Um, and that idea, God is with us, is the word... Um, uh, Emmanuel, right? So remember, this is um, God with us, right? Emmanuel, that's the name that's given. So if you look at um, uh, where it says here, I'll show you what I'm looking at. <clears throat> right, so we're looking at Isaiah chapter 8, right? And it's going to talk about Emmanuel. It's going to talk about it in chapter 7 as well. You see this number 6005, that's Emmanuel. And you can see it's made up of uh, two words, 5973 and 410. And so if you look here in verse 10, you see the 410 and the nine five nine seven three. So it's just the same thing. Emmanuel, this is Emmanuel. Okay, God with us. Okay, so just a little note, side note there. For the Lord spake thus to me, with a strong hand and instructed me that I should not walk in the way of this people saying, say ye not a confederacy to all them of whom this people shall say a confederacy, neither fear ye their fear nor be afraid. So this confederacy is um, an alliance, right? It, it talks here, um, you know, it's saying associate yourselves together, right? Counseling together. Right. All of these different different Hebrew words. But but they're all describing a a covenant with death. Right. So when you go to chapter 28 and it's going to talk about this covenant with death and the overflowing scourge, you can see how these are related. Yes. OK. So this agreement or this covenant with death, this is the. That's why when the overflowing scourge shall pass through, you shall be trodden down by it. Okay. But those that are trusting in this stone, the foundation stone, the tried stone, the precious stone, the sure foundation, he that believeth shall not make haste. And that just is um, uh, the idea here is just that they're, they're not going to be, they're not going to be taken by this flood. It's just, it's, it's more a Hebrew idiom. You know, so you can't really take it literally because it means they will not hurry or 
uh, be eager with excitement or enjoyment, right? Um, so making haste. So they're not going to be overtaken by this flood. Okay. Um, now, so where were we? What were we talking about here? Okay. So when we get back to our, our, our main topic here, we can see then that uh, this, this flood, this arms of the flood that they shall be overflown, this is because the Seventh-day Adventists have made a league, right? Here it's the Jewish nation has made a league. Now, we're not going to see that league until 23 and 24. So they're going to talk about this in verse 22, what's going to happen to the Jews, right? The destruction of Jerusalem and the crucifixion of Christ are both going to be mentioned because the destruction of Jerusalem is the result results from the crucifixion of Christ. And then it's going to, in verse 23 and 24, go back and address that Roman league. And that's what we want to draw on a line, right? Because we're saying verse 23 and 24 is uh, meant to be understand, understood as an individual line. And so we have to be able to take this line historically, and then we have to apply that line within our history. Okay, so when we look at this, here's the line as we've been drawing it up. So I put in the Jewish, the Roman Jewish League there, 161 to 158 BC. And then we have the Battle of Pharsalus, and we have six six thousand two hundred and thirty three days to the Battle of Actium, and that number, the Hebrew number, refers to the word oppression. Okay, and then. We have from the Battle of Actium, 125,200 days, which is uh, 313 times 400. 313 represents uh, the year which the Edict of Milan occurs in, and the 400 symbolizes affliction. And you can see that that period of time is 343 years, which is 7 times 7 times 7 years. And these, these even four times, these are just 360 years. Uh, so that, that's, um, <clears throat> so the 360 years, uh, then, you know, has, starts at Pharsalus and Actium and, and with Edict of Milan and Rome moving to Constantinople or Constantinople being established. And we have dates for both of those. So we have June 13th, 313 for the Edict of Milan. And we have May 11th, 330 AD for the, uh, the dedication naming, whatever, of the city of Constantinople when it's established, however that is. Right. And then we have below this, this line where, uh, we have, uh, the cross and the destruction of Jerusalem. So those are two events specifically marked in Daniel chapter nine, verse 26 and 27, the midst of the week. That's April 27th, 31 AD. And then you have uh, the temple being destroyed on August 6th, 70 AD. So that's a period of 39 years uh, between those two events. Okay. And uh, I could put the exact number of days in there as well, which I haven't. Okay. Any thoughts on this so far? So with, with many of these, we have exact dates, which is, which is kind of nice because those exact days uh, give us um, insight. They give us some symbols that we've applied. So any thoughts about this at this point? Here's the number of days. Any thoughts? <coughs> no thoughts on this at all? So we're looking at this three or this 39 plus year period. Yeah. That, that, yeah, that's, I'm just, I'm just putting in the number of days there just so that we have it. Now we're going to have here, I have to mark, there's the 62 years. I need to put a line here, I guess. Uh, so we're saying it's 36 plus years from the ending of the 70th week to the destruction of the temple. It's less than 36 years because that's, um, that's going to be October, what, October 12th, uh, 34 AD to 
um, August 6, 70 AD. So it's a bit less than 36 years. Just trying to make this look neater. Yeah. So when we put this all together, you got, you know, 61 years because that's an inclusive count plus 39 years plus 243, which equals 343 years in that period of time. So that's that, <clears throat> those way marks there. Now, so we do have seven way marks here, right? At this point, we have seven way marks that we're marking. The 36 years here is just, you know, because you got the 70th week and I'm just marking that 36 years to distinguish it. It's interesting that the 14,346, if you divide it by six, you come up with 2,391. Okay. And the significance of 2,391? Well, I, I was having considered as this gives some type of a representation of the 2300 days and 91. Okay. And 91 is, is 13 times seven. Right. Yeah. Possibly, you know, the, the prime number that is associated with it, that is the, the, the number that is, um, so when I, when I look at these, these numbers, like what you have is uh, 18 times 797. So 797 is a prime number. So you get a prime number out of there that um, that's associated with it. And that prime number is the 139th prime number, which okay. gives you 139, which 139 is 391, right? It's just another iteration of that. So anyway, that's that's just a minor observation. And, and the other number that you had was 2391. So that's like 391 with a two, right? Doubling it. And we have two different periods of 391, uh, as symbols, right? So you have the 391 and a half, half years of, uh, Josiah Lich's prophecy and the 391 years of, um, the prophecy of Josiah and Ezekiel. Okay. So anyway, let's, so, so there are some symbols attached to that. And it's, uh, 39 years itself, which, you know, is kind of related to 391. But, but anyway, so you got, uh, these, what we want to look at is these seven way marks. So the question is, can we place these on a line? Can we just take these seven way marks and mark them as, you know, the first angel arrives? It's empowered, it's or formalized, empowered, and the second angel arrives. It's formalized, empowered, and then the third angel arrives. And can we make this a cohesive line with the period of darkness that precedes it? Or do we need another way mark in here? Right. So so are these all of our way marks? Because if we have a period of darkness, the period of darkness would precede the Roman Jewish League. And we would have to say, how how is the Roman Jewish League? An, an arrival of the first message. How is the Battle of Pharsalus um, a formalization of that message? And then how is the Battle of Actium an empowerment of that message? And then how is the cross the arrival of the second angel? And how is the destruction of the, the temple uh, um, a formalization of that? And how is the Edict of Milan an empowerment of that second angel's message? And then how is the movement of Rome, the capital of Rome from Rome to Constantinople, an arrival of a third message? Now, I can easily see how it all fits, but, you know, all of us need to sort of work on this. So we're, we're not going to put the other ones up in the line there just because of the chromatic or chronological structure here. So we're just going to kind of leave that. But I am going to grab these waymarks symbols here and just place them in this groups. Copy these and borrow them once. It's not working. So we're going to, we're just going to take these and we're going to move each of them. We're going to put this here, this one here, this one here, this one here. So when we constructed this line, we weren't particularly looking at these waymarks and trying to get the number of them to be seven. Don't need this one. So this one would apply. But I know where I'd put it, but okay. So for now we have seven way marks and we have a first and a second message. And then we have a third arriving. And, uh, 
we would have to say, what is the period of darkness? What is this line about? You know, based on the verses that we looked at in the application historically, this is about Rome, right? And what is Rome doing? What does Rome have to do? Establish the vision. Right. So it's going to exalt itself to establish the vision, right? So that's going to happen. And so prior to this, the period of darkness would be, would, would relate to Rome and the fact that it's not established, right? That is, there is a history that's here where Rome is going to exalt itself to establish the vision, but it has to become connected with God's people in order to do so, right? So we do have events where Rome is connected. It's going to exalt itself to establish the vision earlier. But now this would be the establishment of the vision. Okay. So this is, 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 this is not just Rome exalting itself. It's Rome becoming established so that it can be there for the crucifixion of Christ, for the destruction of Jerusalem, um, but also for the persecution that's going to follow after. So we can see how this completely fits with this line that that we have, right? So this, right, this is Daniel chapter, um, I'm going to just borrow this, right? So it's going to be just these few verses that this line is addressing. So it's going to start with the Jewish Roman League, Roman Jewish League, however you want to put it. But there is a period of darkness before, and that period of darkness how how would we describe it? Are you looking for an adjective to describe this? Well, just a, a phrase, a word, you know. So Rome, you know, Rome here is going to come into contact with the Jewish people with this. I mean, we know that they have, um, they're involved earlier, right? But But as far as an agreement, this league, this league is essential prophetically as a symbol that we're going to call the first angel arriving. So remember, when we have a message, it's in response to a period of darkness. Now, you know, often the darkness is a moral darkness or something like that, but it can also uh, be just uh, um, something that hasn't happened yet, right? That that has to unfold historically or prophetically. So so how would we describe, we, we're saying it's a darkness, but what is it? I mean, you can use all kinds of words. So not a single word, but just a bunch of words, whatever, whatever it is. How would we want to, if we're going to share with somebody what this line is and we have this darkness, how would we describe it? Darkness in understanding the word of God. Okay, well, that's too broad because that's pretty much every darkness. Just be a bit more specific to this line. So you think about the line. We know that this line is about Rome in connection with God's people, with literal Israel. It's going to crucify Christ, right? And now initially, Christ is going to be the one that's crucified, but it's it's going to lead to the destruction of Jerusalem and to a type of persecution that's going to develop. Uh, you know, first it starts with the Jews, the wars of the Jews against Rome. But it's going to end with uh, the persecution of Christians. And that's why you're going to have the Edict of Milan in 313. And then you're going to have that number of days, 6,176 days, which the Hebrew number is naked, stripped, and destitute. That's what the word means. So we have the other period of time, 6,233, which represents oppression. Um, so there is there is oppression that happens. In, in the beginning of this history, and there's persecution that happens at the end of this history. So this is, it, historically, this is about Rome and the Jews. But it's going gonna, it's gonna to start with literal Jews, and it's going to end up with Christians at the end. Correct. So, so how would we describe the darkness? We know what the line is about. So what is, what is this, this line unfolding us to understand? So what is not understood? prior to this line beginning that's that this line reveals to us at the end of the long line because this is part of the history of rome but it's history of roman connection with the jews so we could just say well the darkness is we don't know about 
the history of Roman connection with the Jews. But uh, that's not, I mean, that's part of it. What needs to be revealed to God's people in this line? Why, why are we given Daniel 11, verse 23 and 24? So the Jews don't understand the danger of having this league, right? Correct. So the Jews, the Jews didn't understand any of the leagues that they had made. Right. I know. But if we're going to look at this darkness specifically, I mean, it must deal with that history just before this Roman Jewish league. So one of the things we have is the Maccabean Rebellion, right? Okay. So that Maccabean Rebellion reveals a type of darkness that is not understood. Now, Judas Maccabeus, is he the Messiah? No. Okay. Do people believe he's the Messiah? Yes. Okay. So that must be part of the darkness. Now, why do they go into this Roman Jewish league? What's what's the reasoning of the Jews to do this? Why are they making a league with Rome? So we've had the Maccabean Rebellion. Um, who makes this league? The Jews make the league with Rome to be separated from Greece. Okay, right? So so they're they're looking at Rome as a deliverer to some degree. Right? Right. Okay. 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 So what what else? So so they've thrown off the the yoke of Antiochus the fourth epiphanies, right? Um so they wanted to maintain their, their political freedom. So the king of the north still posed a threat. So they made a treaty with Imperial Rome. It's a natural thing for the Jewish nation to do. I'm just reading something that somebody wrote. Okay, so we we have this league, and it's it's the result of a false revival, a, re- a revolution, a rebellion, and and so we, we're going to say it's the time of the end as well. So we have to remember when we have the first angel arriving, it's the time of the end. Um, so what time of the end is it? Time of the end of the Jews being the denominated people of God. Okay, well, that's going to happen in in, uh, 34 AD. So there's still God's denominated people in this history. And and we're looking at this Roman Jewish League, we're looking at this this three-year period, a four-year inclusive period. So so basically it starts with uh, the end of the Jews being under Greek dominion, right? They've thrown off the yoke of Antiochus the Fourth Epiphanes, right? So they've they've thrown off the yoke of Greece, but they've taken on a new yoke that they're unaware of, right? They don't see it as that. So so it's really the time of the end of Greece, and and Miller marks it that way, doesn't he? I would think so. Yeah. Okay. So so that would be the simplest way to look at it, if we're going to look at it as the time of the end. Um, it's going to be the time of the end of Greece. So, okay, so this is the time of the end of the prophecy, and that prophecy is the prophecy regarding Greece. And and that darkness, uh, then, if we're going to look at the darkness itself, so the darkness that they have is the prophetic significance of Rome. And that's what's going to be revealed in this in this line, is the prophetic significance of Rome. In relation to the to the Messiah, can we see that that's what what's happening here? So they they overthrow Greece, but they have if they're studying Daniel's prophecies, they would know that there's another kingdom that's going to come. So they have a misapplication of the prophecies. I don't actually believe that the Jews uh, uh, were applying Daniel chapter eleven uh, to what was happening at the time it happened. Later on, Jews tried to make an application of Daniel chapter 11 to um, Antiochus Epiphanes, but not at the time. There's no evidence that at the time they were reading Daniel chapter 11 and trying to figure out what was happening, that they were fulfilling prophecy, right? This is going to be a later application. So later on, they tried to justify this. And this would be a lot later. I mean, right now I've been studying a lot about the second century and, um, you know, people who try to say that Daniel was written in the second century because it's describing these events. But when we look through Daniel chapter 11, 
you really have to stretch things to get it to fit to a Tychus Epiphanes all through that history. So they're going to even have Daniel 12, verse 1, as being applied to a Tychus Epiphanes, right? Uh, and I don't, I don't see it at all. I mean, it's so clearly referring to Rome and then pagan Rome. None of this is referring to a Tychus Epiphanes. He's, he's not part of Daniel chapter 11 at all, other than, you know, they're going to mention this, this, this league, which happens after those events of a Tychus Epiphanes. But they're not going to mention Tychus Epiphanes. He's not symbolized as any one of the kings of, of the north because Rome has already exalted itself to establish the vision prior to this, right? So Rome is in that period of darkness. Rome has exalted itself. The Jews are unaware of this, right? So much so that they make a league. And, and you can start to see how this fits in with our line. Okay, so we have the Roman Jewish League. That's the arrival of the first message. Now, what about the Battle of Pharsalus? I mean, we're probably going to have to deal with this more tomorrow. So the Battle of Pharsalus is a civil war. It's Caesar's civil war fought, fought on August 9th, 48 BC, near Pharsalus in central Greece. Jewish Caesar and his allies form up opposite the army of the Roman Republic under the command of Pompey. Pompey had backing of major Roman senators, and his army significantly outnumbered the uh, veteran Caesarian legions. Now, one of the things we, we could have added to this line if we wanted to, but, but I don't think it belongs in this line, I just want to mention, is Pompey's siege of Jerusalem. Now, because we could have put that in this line, and, and maybe we, we still could, maybe we could just say, you know, that's the formalization of the message or something like that. But I think it belongs to another line. Um, I think this line here is is very specific because of what it says as far as uh, even for a time. But if we didn't have uh, the Battle of Pharsalus and the Edict of Milan in these lines, we would have put 63 BC in there somewhere. Uh, but but because of this, these two applications of even for a time, um, we don't put it in there. But, you know, we have this Roman Jewish League and then we say, well, why, how come we're not including uh, the siege of Jerusalem in 63 B.C. under Pompey? How come we're not including that prior to the Battle of Pharsalus? Right. I mean, we could have maybe put it in there, but it it. I, I would have problems with it, and, and we're going to have to look at that a bit more tomorrow, because I think we need to consider it. Like, I don't think we should just dismiss it. But this is about Rome exalting itself to establish the vision. And we would say, well, when Rome comes against Jerusalem and takes it captive, wouldn't that really have something to do with it? Right. You understand what I'm asking there? And we're, and we're saying it's not part of this line. But it's kind of a, a, a support linchpin for the line. Well, if it's a support linchpin, then it would have to be a waymark and we would put it in. But I'm saying we're not putting it in. Okay. Right. Now, I have my reasons, and it has to do with this line itself. Obviously, it's part of these lines of Rome earlier, right? We, we have it in, in, our, in our study. We have, it, we have it listed in other verses. Right? We're going to have uh, Pompey come in. And uh, where did we put that? That's going to be way back. Yeah, so we had done that. I'm just trying to see which verse we had it in. Yeah, we actually do put it in. Um, we do put it in verse 23. So maybe, maybe, you know, I was thinking that we had it earlier, but maybe that's where we have it is in verse 23. So we might have to put it in this line. Okay, I see. Yeah, because we have it earlier as well. So we have it in verse 16, um, where we have shall be consumed. That's going to be the siege. Now that's still going to be under, right? So that's when Rome exalts. So that's going to be the end of the Greek line. We have Pompey there. And then we have him, again, we mention him in verse 23. So he shall come up and enter Syria. Right. And then you're going to have. OK, so maybe we're going to have to rethink how we're going to do this line. 
what we might have to do, I don't know. See, I don't know how you could take, the only way that you would do that is you would put uh, the period of darkness um, dealing with this Roman Jewish league and then the siege would be the formalization or, or the arrival of the message. So anyway, we're going to have to look at this tomorrow. So any final thoughts before we close this prayer? You know, we got, we got to look at the siege of Rome tomorrow. So try to get informed on that and the battle of Pharsalus. The, is it the siege of Rome or the siege of Jerusalem? The siege of Jerusalem by Rome. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. So we're going to look okay. at that. 63 BC. Okay. Well, let's pray. Uh, dear Father in heaven, thank you for this day, uh, for all your blessings, and uh, for the study and the things we learn and the way that you correct us when we're in error. And so we just ask for your presence throughout this day in our personal study and all the things that we do. And um, we leave all things in your hands. And we ask for your angels' care and protection for those that we love and um, that your will uh, can be done in their lives. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.